All right, our last little topic here is going to be based on the fact that we need to remember that atoms and molecules are three-dimensional. They're not just flat and motionless like when we draw them on paper using those Lewis dot diagrams. Molecules have very distinctive shapes and features that give the molecular compounds their properties. And like so many of our chemical properties, these are coming from the internal electrostatic forces between like and opposite charges. When we make a single bond, a single covalent bond, we have the nucleus of one atom attracted to the electron cloud of the other. But those electron clouds repel each other, as do the nuclei. And so we end up seeing this thing called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And this Vesper theory, as you see up here, is a simple method of predicting shapes of covalent compounds. And you can see the statement that the arrangement of atoms around some central atom is going to be determined by the repulsions between the electron pairs in the valence shell of the central atom. And you can see that there. <laughs> and my computer's going very slow, so it's going to highlight it very slowly for you. And so essentially what's going to happen is lone pairs or atoms are going to push themselves as far away from each other as possible. And this can get kind of crazy as far as shapes are concerned and bond angles and electron geometry and orbital hybridizations. So if you go on and take further advanced chemistry, you might have to deal with this a lot more than what we're going to look at right now. Right now we're just going to focus on some simple structures, some simple shapes. And that's this chart that will be coming up here. We're just going to look at essentially what happens if we have one, two, three, or four, well, two, three, or four things around the central atom. And so here we see the shapes that we want to be most familiar with. If I have two atoms around the central atom, and you can see here our central atom is denoted by the capital letter A, and so if I have two of these atoms around my central atom, then they will push themselves as far apart as possible into a linear formation, 180 degrees separating those atoms. If there are three atoms around my central atom and no lone pairs, then it's going to be in a trigonal planar fashion. All four of these atoms will be in the same plane, and you can view like the tips of a triangle. They're going to be about 120 degrees apart from each other, those outer atoms. If there are four atoms around my central atom, they will arrange themselves into a tetrahedral. And now you can see some perspective. The dashed line, meaning it, the, at, that atom's going away, and the darker line, meaning that atom is coming towards us. And so we see a little more three-dimensionality here in our tetrahedral shape. Now, if we have three atoms and one lone pair around our central atom, even though there's three atoms, they won't be all on the same plane like our trigonal planar because that lone pair will push those three atoms away from each other. And so we end up having a trigonal pyramidal situation. Kind of looks like one of those back scratchers with the wooden um, spheres at the end and you can hold the one and scratch someone's back. Uh, that's kind of what it reminds me of. So, But that's trigonal pyramidal. And then our last shape we want to be concerned with is if we have two lone pairs and two atoms around our central atom, then it will take on a bent shape. All right. And if you kind of look at the tetrahedral shape, if we remove one of the atoms and replace it with a lone pair, that's the trigonal pyramidal. If we remove two atoms and we have two lone pairs, that's the bent shape. So that's where those are coming from. So that helps determine our shapes of our molecules. Again, our simpler molecules, and we'll be building those in our model building lab. The final piece to the puzzle then is to determine whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar. Okay, and we have looked at bond polarity, if you remember, we have our electronegativity values, and when we look at our electronegativity values, 
Let me skip ahead. Hold on. I was going the wrong way. But when we subtract our electronegativity values, we can determine whether or not a bond is nonpolar, polar, or ionic. And since we're only talking about molecular compounds right now, we're just looking at the nonpolar versus polar. A molecule has multiple bonds. So you can have polar bonds in a molecule, but the molecule itself can be nonpolar. I know, crazy. So we need to kind of look at that. And the shape of the molecule has everything to do with this. First off, if we have a molecule and none of the bonds in the molecule are polar, they're all nonpolar, then we will definitely have a nonpolar compound. So if there are no dipole moments, if there are no polar bonds in a molecule, then the whole molecule is nonpolar. If there is one polar bond, then the molecule will definitely be polar. So here we see the carbon-hydrogen bonds are always nonpolar. So there's four of them in this molecule, making the molecule nonpolar. Over here, these three bonds are nonpolar, but we have a carbon-chlorine bond. And when I look at my carbon-chlorine connection with my electronegativities, carbon is 2.6, chlorine is 3.2, that's polar. And so in that molecule, I have a dipole moment. And I can draw that on my bond. There is a polar bond there. And so you see there's a net dipole on the molecule, aka this molecule is polar. So again, no polar bonds, molecule nonpolar. One polar bond, molecule polar. More than one, eek, we got to look at the shape. Okay, and so yes, again, our first scenario, one polar bond, definitely polar. Now look over at the next one. I've got three polar bonds. The barium fluorine bond is polar. And you can see I have the dipole moments pointing towards fluorine, our most electronegative element. Well, all these dipoles cancel each other out. They're all pointing in different directions. And so because of that fact, we have a nonpolar molecule. Unlike next door, where I've got my nitrogen-hydrogen bond polar, all the dipoles now are pointing towards the nitrogen. They're reinforcing each other. And so because of that, this molecule has a net dipole, and it is a polar molecule. If I had nitrogen with three Fs, and all the dipoles were pointing away, the same thing would happen. This time we'd have a net dipole this way, but we would still have a polar molecule. And then lastly over here, tetrahedral. If my tetrahedral has all four of the same bonds, like if these guys were chlorine and these guys were chlorines, then all the dipoles would cancel out. But here we see a scenario where we have two hydrogens, and we know these bonds are nonpolar, and then we have these two bonds polar. So we see a net dipole, we see a polar molecule. I know this is kind of abstract, and it really does help when you build the molecules in class and draw them, and you can kind of envision whether or not these dipoles are reinforcing each other or canceling each other out. And that's what we'll be doing in class. I hope this helps, and I'll see you soon.